menthol cigarettes. Smoke more, breathe less. <coughs> And in my mother's womb was fashioned to be flesh in the t in the time of ten months, being compacted in blood of the seed of man. That's right. Of the seed That's of that man. Where seed is sperm, and sperm is comes through having sex. It's shut out of your father's rod. Right. And put it in layman terms. In his penis. That's right. That means a man put his penis in a woman and bust off in it. Then the angel said to him, take out the entrails of this fish and lay up his heart and his gall and his liver for thee. For these are necessary for useful medicines. The rest of the chapters of the book of Esther, Go ahead. which are found neither in the Hebrew nor in the Chaldee. Greetings, fellow worker slaves, podcasting at 128 kilobits from the Fortress of Squalitude, not far from the Redneck Mecca. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts is in my lap demanding attention, and Buttons is mutilating something on the floor. I can't tell what. Yes, it's a podcast hosted by a guy and his cat. Get over it. This is going to be a bit of a different episode than as usual, I'm afraid. Um, though, if you're a fan of Maccabees, you'll be happy for this one. We have landed a new product line at work, and as a result, I have been putting in a lot of hours this past week. 72 of them, to be exact. Even worse, this is going to continue up until at least the middle of of March, which means I may not be able to go to NanoCon, and I won't know for certain until the day before the con. I may be off that Saturday, but if I've had to work the night before, that means I'd have to stay up over 24 hours if I were to go to NanoCon. I'm nearly 50 years old, and that ain't happening. It's possible I'll know before this if I can go or not, but I'm not betting on it. We're having a number of issues which are slowing down us getting the stuff out, so I'm reasonably certain that I won't have a firm answer before then. I'm also not wanting to just take time off since the kind of money I'll be making is insane during that period of time. Some of it will be double time. That's $32 an hour. No way I can turn that down right now. I'll add that the only reason I'm getting a day off this week is that they have to do some equipment repairs in another department. So there's no point in us prepping stuff if they can't process it. Needless to say, I haven't really had a lot of time to put together news stories for this episode. Um, even the obvious one, like that horrific shooting in Parkland, Florida, I... <laughs> I know the article, uh, I just don't have time to get put down coherent thoughts about it. Thankfully, Skullbeard was kind enough to sit down with me on part of my day off and record a whole bang bunch of Apocrypha episodes. And so you'll be getting that instead of a news episode like you'd expect. And I will say, surprisingly, that the stuff we're reading now is, um, well, not necessarily more interesting, uh, but better than what we have been reading. And you won't hear it in this episode, but in an upcoming episode, uh, there is some stuff that is actually surprisingly good. Uh, even taking into account the fact that one has lowered expectations when listening to uh, the Apocrypha. And yeah, I'm really tired, so that's why I'm kind of weird mumbling. All right, some other housekeeping bits, and then we'll get the Apocrypha. 
The first is that the Great Kita Roundup continues. I only managed to snag one of the ferals to get spayed, and when we got her to the vet, they couldn't operate that day. She's got a bad eye, and they need to remove it before they spay her. Or they might do it at the same time, I'm not really sure. So she's locked up in my bedroom, which pisses buzz... Uh, buzz nuts. Which pisses buttons and fuzz off, nuts off to no end. Normally, I just keep her in the spare bathroom, but since it's going to be so long before they can fix her at the clinic, I felt that would be cruel. I don't want to let her roam around outside, as I may not be able to catch her ahead of time to take her to the clinic on the day she's scheduled to go for her surgery. She's an adorable little gal and happily snuggles with me when I get into bed. She's also in heat, so she meows a lot. Hopefully, when it's over, she'll just to being an outside kitty again. If I could, I'd do like Hemingway did and have hundreds of cats running around the place, but to do that, I'd need a passel of servants just to empty the litter boxes. Not something I can afford to do. I did manage to go to the local Democratic Party potluck this past week, and the good news is that not only did we have a much larger turnout than we've had at recent events, but we have a number of people actually running for local office. This is a big change from previous years. In fact, the entire state of Tennessee has seen an uptick in Democrats running for local offices. In some cases, it's been something like 30 years since a Democrat ran for a particular office, and now there are Democrats going for it. I'm not seeing quite the bold moves I'd like out of them, but incremental progress is better than none, of course. And... With that, because I'm bleary-eyed and tired, I am going to turn things over to Skullbeard and I. And this will be the end of Second Maccabees. And maybe... No, it will just be the end of Second Maccabees. Ta-da! Howdy! Hey, howdy! Looks like you've relocated to the kitchen. Uh, nope. Actually, I I just uh, rotated my desk ninety degrees and rewired my studio. And how's my levels? Um, you're good. Okay, loud enough. No sixty hertz. No, it's really on my end. Yeah. So I've just. Um, I tore down the studio and rebuilt it, but I don't know if it'll work. Like I still, I still hear sixty hertz hum, so it is what it is. No, I don't, I don't hear anything. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. Oh. So, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week until the middle of March? Well, 12 hours a day, yeah, yeah, yeah. Until the middle of March. What in hell? I'm sorry. Oh, you have no idea. Um, one of the things that we have to do is, and we've so far had to do it almost every day, is what's called plug and trim. That's where we take big old hunks of brisket, some that are about as long as my arm. Um, yeah. And they kind of look, it's the same basic shape as a lung, right? Right. Um, on, the, on the narrow end, there's a large head. And what we have to do when we plug and trim them is we have to cut out sections of fat. And okay. on one side, there's a, uh, it's sort of like a parenthesis shaped hunk that we have to cut out. And it's usually like two inches wide, um, two inches thick, and six to eight inches long, depending on, you know, various circumstances. And then 
on the side, it's something that looks like um, the um, oh, you know the 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 Egyptian stylized eye, uh, like eye of Horus. I think it's what it is. Oh yeah. It, it it looks like that, and we have to cut that out. Oh. And um, then somebody with an electric knife will shave one the fat off of one side because that fat can be, you know, an inch or more thick, and it covers the entire side. And supposedly, after the fifteenth, they'll be getting the meat in that's already had that process done to it, so we won't have to do it. But that's why we're having to spend so much time at work. Oh, so you get to do all the prep work, too. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but hey, the, when I when I do overtime, they're paying me 25 bucks an hour, and when I have to work seven days... I get double time for the seventh day. Oh, nice. Um, I, uh, Alberta labor laws, <clears throat> anything over eight hours a day is overtime. Yeah, that's... So time and a half. That's the way ours is. Uh, and not our law, but that's the way the union contract works. Yeah, nice. Nice. And on my days of rest, two days a week that I have off, if I get called in for overtime, it's double time. Yeah. It's a pretty sweet gig, actually. Yeah. Gotta love them union jobs. Yeah, I, I tell you. Um, I'm happier than a clam, even if I don't like what I'm doing. Yep. Absolutely. Well, with all this work and all this overtime, you're rolling in dose. Well, not yet. We, I mean, the check that I get next, you know, this coming week will have the real money on it. The previous checks have had a little bit of extra money, but this this next one will have some real money, and then the one after that will have the really real money, because that one will be a full seven days. Nice. Yeah. And start catching up on all that stuff you've let slide so far. Yep, yep. All your bills out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be nice to pay the electric bill on the day it arrives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, uh, are you working tonight? No, no. Uh, um, oh, yeah, that we, w the reason I'm off tonight is because officially, uh, well, there's two reasons. One is is that we would normally get President's Day off. Oh, nice. And the other is that um, they're doing some uh, maintenance work on some of the equipment in another department. Okay. So, hmm. otherwise, I'd 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 be getting ready to go. Uh huh. Uh, Alrighty then. Uh, missing out on the shitty weather up here, but I'm not missing much. Uh, yeah, it has been really weird weather here. Um, it was eighty. One day this week. Uh, okay, that's 25, probably close to 30 degrees. <clears throat> and that is, I, I have never seen it that warm. It Here. Um, in this weather. Uh, or in this time of year. Uh, and then it dropped... Um, you know... 20 degrees the next day um, and it's in the f it was in the 50s today and then this week it's going to be in the 60s during the day um, and then drop some you know but it's not it's not really going to get significantly below freezing f for the foreseeable future which is totally abnormal here. Uh, let's see. It's cloudy and fucking cold. Suck it up, buttercup. Oh, wait. 
Satan's fiery nuts froze solid earlier this evening. You should probably stay inside. Minus 21. Mm. Well, that's Celsius, so that's... Uh, that's just below zero Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Units. See. Minus six Fahrenheit. Yeah. So cold, but not as yeah. cold as, you know, minus 20 Fahrenheit would be. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, uh, it rarely gets down to minus 40 years. Oh. I think. Um, minus 40 is the same in either. Yeah. Either yeah. System. I couldn't remember if it was that or minus 42. Nope. Right on minus 40. Point where alcohol freezes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a buddy who was um, stationed in Alaska. Oh, yeah. And he said, the you know, the first thing that the sergeant told them when they got to Alaska was, if you set your alcohol outside in the winter to cool it down when you bring it in warm it up a little let it warm up before you drink it because he goes because it is cold enough that if you drink it you know immediately after bringing it inside you will freeze your esophagus and die yep uh, it's a big problem in Russia apparently yeah Much of, oh, yay, there's only seven chapters and three max. Oh, <laughs> we're getting off easy tonight. Something like that. Four Mac. Did you ever track down five through nine? Other than the, um, <laughs> uh, the wacky stuff? No, I could never, I, you know, I, not that I've had much time, but uh, there doesn't appear to be any of anything else. And I've checked with people who would know, and they've said it is the kind of stuff that is so obscure that if English translations of it exist, they are only in academic journals. Oh, okay. Interesting. Which... In theory, I could get copies of for free. Um, here's a thing that you may not know about that um, you would probably be interested in. There is a hashtag called I Can Has PDF. Oh, on, I've heard this. On Twitter, where if you want access to an academic journal that's behind a paywall... You link to the journal article you're interested in, put hashtag, you know, put the hashtag I can has PDF, and then somebody will DM you and say, hey, I can get this for you. You, and then, you know, you delete the, 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 the tweet, and they'll email you the PDF for free. Interesting. Um, because a lot of a lot of researchers do not like the fact that their stuff is behind a paywall, so they're more than happy to help you out. Uh, um, but you know, try. I just don't have the time to try and track that shit down and and wait for somebody to um, respond, even if I do find it. Huh? I may have to look for some stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> I can scribble that down on my scratch pad. <sighs> Actually, since I got Twitter open, all right. So three Mac one. When Philippator learned from those who returned that the regions which he had controlled had been seized by Antiochus, he gave orders to all his forces, both infantry and cavalry, took with him his sister Arsinoe, and marched out to the region near Raphia where Antiochus's supporters were encamped. But a certain Theodotus, determined to carry out the plot he had devised, 
took with him the best of the Ptolemaic arms that had been previously issued to him, and crossed over by night to the tent of Ptolemy, intending single-handed to kill him and thereby end the war. But Docetius, known as the son of Drimilus, a Jew by birth who later changed his religion and apostatized from the ancestral traditions, had led the king away and arranged that a certain insignificant man should sleep in the tent, and so it turned out this man incurred the vengeance meant for the king. Dun dun dun! Double crossed again. So, <laughs> is this saying that the king in the previous book, whom we were told was killed, wasn't actually killed? Because remember, uh, I, I I know I know it's so long ago, but uh, <laughs> it it. Well, it's, it's not that. It's I mean, people keep dying, and then they're back, and then there's somebody else, and then... But, but, but I mean, that seems to be what this is saying, is that um, uh, Judas, who, you know, snuck into the tent and killed the king, didn't actually kill the king because it was some ordinary guy? Is it... Uh, it's is really this, hey. It, it, this reminds me of the that that scene in Misery, you know, <laughs> where she tells him, you know, you have to start from, you know, where you ended the last book. Misery Chastain must be, fa- you know, be in the ground when the book starts. <laughs> so as you know, it, it's like okay, we we didn't think there was going to be a sequel, so. Now we got to come up with an awkward explanation. Uh, um, God, what was that Vincent Price movie where they that happened? Um, I have no idea. Was it the abom- It was the Abominable Doctor Fives. <laughs> That's what it was. Um, yeah, he. Uh, they, they made the first one. You know, it's a slow budget horror movie, and at the end of the first one, he commits suicide. Um, has himself uh, buried in a in a tomb with his dead wife, and you know has his blood slowly drained out of him, and you know he's that's it, he's done, he's dead. He's saying this in a voiceover, right? That he's he's finished forever, and he's never going to, um, uh, you know, he's he's done, he's gotten his vengeance, so there's no point in him living. And it was such a successful movie, they decided to do a sequel. And the beginning of the sequel, you know, show that they ran the film backwards at, from the end of the first one and dubbed it a new voiceover with him saying, you know, now, you know, so many years have passed and, you know, the timer has automatically brought me back to life, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, wow, that's a really thin explanation. Uh, of course, I happened. To, I I noticed this because I was watching a double feature on <laughs> on late night TV when I was in high school. They um, they showed the first. Uh, it was they showed a, the abominable Doctor Fives, and then the sequel, which is like Fives Rises Again or Fives Again. But that's what that was. So Return that's the Fives. Yeah. Huh. So I'm guessing something like that must happen for them to, you know, do this. All right. Let me get to my section here. When a bitter fight resulted and matters were turning out rather in favor of Antiochus, Arsinoe went to the troops with wailing and tears. Her locks all disheveled and extort exhorted them to defend themselves and their children and wives bravely, promising to give each of them two minas of gold if they won the battle. And I have to ask, why dude uh, brought his sister with him? I mean, is he like, you know, Commodus? You know, what, the bangy sister? Or is, you know... Well, you got to keep it in the family. Yeah, or is, you know, his, his, his reasoning, well... The soldiers get horny, <laughs> and I don't, you know, my sister's not doing anything else, so. 
And so it came about that the enemy was routed in the action, and many captives also were taken. Now that he had foiled the plot, Ptolemy decided to visit the neighboring cities and encourage them. Encourage them to do what? Just as an aside, a mina is about three months' pay for a worker or 50 shekels. Ah. So 50 shekels of gold would be... Oh, where's the shekel? Uh, Two-fifths of an ounce or 11 grams. That's a whack of gold. Yeah. 550 grams of gold. That's like a pound of gold. More than a pound. That's yeah. nutty. I know. Because it would be twice that. It would be over a kilogram. That'd be like two and a half pounds of gold. Holy fuck. Alright, my turn? Yep. By doing this and by endowing their sacred enclosures with gifts, he strengthened the moral morale of his subjects. Since the Jews had sent some of the, their council and elders to greet him, to bring him gifts of welcome and to gra- congratulate him on what had happened, he was all the more eager to visit them as soon as possible. After he had arrived in Jerusalem, he offered sacrifice to the supreme God and made thank offerings and did what was fitting for the holy place. Then, upon entering the place, and being impressed by its excellence and its beauty, he hmm. mo- go. Yeah, no, it's your turn. Yeah. He marveled at the good order of the temple and conceived a desire to enter the holy of holies. Wow, chicka, wow, wow. When they said that this was not permitted because not even members of their own nation were allowed to enter, nor even all of the priests, but only the high priest who was preeminent over all, and he only once a year, the king was by no means persuaded. Even after the law had been read to him, he did not cease to maintain that he ought to enter, saying, Even if those men are deprived of this honor, I ought not to be. So, he's Donald Trump. Yep, seems to be. A malignant narcissist or something. Yes. And he inquired why, when he entered every other temple, no one there had stopped him. And someone heedlessly said that it was wrong to take this as a sign in itself. <clears throat> but since this has happened, the king said, why should not I at least enter, whether they wish it or not? Then the priests in all their vestments prostrated themselves and entreated the supreme God to aid in the present situation and to avert the violence of this evil design, and they filled the temple with cries and tears. And those who remained behind in the city were alighted and hurried out, supposing that something mysterious was occurring. Boy, they're wailing loudly if the entire city can hear them. The virgins who had been enclosed in their chambers Wait a minute. Why would they have virgins locked up? Um, well, you know. Yeah, yeah but it's, as far as I know, that wasn't a thing. I mean, the Romans had something like that with the Vestial Virgins. Um, hmm. But, uh... Saving them for later? <laughs> <laughs> the flavor saver. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just weird. It it seems a bit incongruous, <laughs> even for this book. Uh, the let me start that line again. The virgins who had been enclosed in their chambers rushed out with their mothers, sprinkled their hair with dust, and filled the streets with groans and lamentations. I'm sure they did. Yeah, those women who had recently been arrayed for marriage, abandoned the bridal chambers prepared for wedded union, and neglecting neglecting proper modesty in a disorderly rush flocked together in the city. Mothers and nurses abandoned even newborn children here and there, some in houses and some in the streets, and with a back, without a backward look, they crowded together at the most high temple. Various were the supplications of those gathered there because of what the king was profanely plotting. In addition, the bolder of the citizens 
would not tolerate the completion of his plans or the fulfillment of his intended purpose. They shouted to their followers to take arms and die courageously for the ancestral law and created a considerable disturbance in the holy place. And being barely restrained by the old men and the elders, they resorted to the same posture of supplication as the others. Meanwhile, the crowd, as before, was engaged in prayer. Because that works! <laughs> yes, yes it does. While the elders near the king tried in various ways to change his arrogant mind from the plan that he had conceived, but he, in his arrogance, took heed of nothing and began now to approach, determined to bring the aforementioned plan to a conclusion. When those who, are, who were around him observed this, they turned, together with our people, to call upon him, who has all the power to defend them in the present trouble and not to overlook this unlawful and haughty deed? I might as well take the next two. Yeah. This continuous, vehement, and concerted cry of the crowds resulted in an immense uproar, for it seemed that not only the men, but also the walls and the whole earth around echoed, because indeed, all at that time preferred death to the profanation of the place. Okay, so everybody's got their uh, panties in a twist because this guy went into the temple? Well, yeah, looks that way. Um, reminds me of the Ethiopian temple that supposedly holds the Ark of the Covenant. Um, like only one or two priests are allowed in there. Everybody else is prohibited. There is armed guards. And, um, Interesting. I, yeah, I've seen pictures of the of, of the place. I mean, it's not totally locked down or you know. You can go so far, you know, like you're, you're, you can walk on the grounds, but the actual temple itself, you know, you can't enter and the armed guards um, only allow certain people in. And it's like I said, one or two priests. Um, so nobody really knows if they have them. They just know that that's what, you know, they claim. And I have a feeling since most people don't know that story, probably they don't most religious experts don't believe there's anything in there at all. That would not surprise me. Where's Indiana Jones when we need him? Yeah. Then the high priest Simon, facing the sanctuary, bending his knees and extending his hands with calm dignity, prayed as follows. Lord, Lord, King of the heavens and sovereign of all creation, Holy among the holy ones, the only ruler, almighty, give attention to us who are suffering grievously from an impious and profane man, puffed up in his audacity and power. For you, the creator of all things and the governor of all, are a just ruler, and you judge those who have done anything in insolence and arrogance. Wow. Uh, that description sounds like somebody. Yep. Somebody orange. Uh -huh. You destroyed those who in the past committed injustice, among whom were even giants who trusted in their strength and boldness, whom you destroyed by bring, bringing upon them a boundless flood. You consumed with fire and sulfur the men of Sodom who acted arrogantly, who were notorious for their vices, and you made them an example to those who should come afterward. You made known your mighty power by inflicting many and varied punishments on the audacious, audacious Pharaoh who had enslaved your holy people Israel. And when he pursued them with chariots and a mass of troops, you overwhelmed him in the depths of the sea, but carried through safely those who had put their confidence in you, the ruler over the whole creation. And when they had seen works of your hands, they praised you, the Almighty. You, O King, when you had created the boundless and immeasurable earth, wrong on both accounts, actually three accounts, chose this city and sanctified this place for your name, though you have no need of anything, and when you had glorified it by your magnificent manifestation, you made it a firm foundation for the glory of your great and honored name. And because you love the house of Israel, you promised that if we should have reserve, 
Oh, if we should have reverses and tribulation should overtake us, you would listen to our petition when we came to this place and pray. And indeed, you are faithful and true. And because oftentimes when our fathers were oppressed, you helped them in their humiliation and rescued them from great evils. See now, O holy king, that because of our many and great sins, we are crushed with suffering, subjected to our enemies, and overtaken by helplessness. In our downfall, this audacious and profane man undertakes to violate the holy place on earth dedicated to your glorious name. For your dwelling, the heaven of heavens, is unapproachable by man. But because you graciously bestowed your glory upon the people Israel, you sanctified this place. Do not punish us for the defilement committed by these men, or call us to account for this profanation, lest the transgressors boast in their wrath, or exult in the arrogance of their tongues, saying, We have trampled down the house of the sanctuary, as offensive houses are trampled down. Wipe away our sins and disperse our errors, and reveal your mercy at this hour. Speedily let your mercies overtake us, and put praises in the mouth of those who are downcast and broken in spirit, and give us peace. Thereupon God, who oversees all things, the first Father of all, holy among the holy ones, having heard the lawful supplication, scourged him who exalted himself in insolence and audacity. He shook him on this side, and that as a reed is shaken by the wind, so that he lay helpless on the ground, and besides being paralyzed in his limbs, was unable even to speak, since he was smitten by a righteous judgment. So he had an epileptic seizure. Sounds like. Then both friends and bodyguards, seeing the severe punishment that had overtaken him, and fearing lest he should lose his life, quickly dragged him out, panic-stricken in their exceeding great fear. After a while he recovered, and though he had been punished, he by no means repented, but went away uttering bitter threats. When he arrived in Egypt, he increased in his deeds of malice, abetted by the previously mentioned drinking companions and comrades, who were strangers in ev to everything just. He's got drinking buddies. Mm -hmm. Nice. <sighs> He was not content with his uncounted licentious deeds, but he also continued with such audacity that he framed evil reports in the va various localities, and many of his friends, intently observing the king's purpose, themselves also followed his will. He proposed to inflict the public disgrace upon the Jewish community, and he set up a stone on the tower in the courtyard with this inscription. None of those who do not sacrifice shall enter their sanctuaries, and all Jews shall be subjected to a registration involving poll tax and to the status of slaves. Those who objected to this are to be taken by force and put to death. That sounds like a dick. Yep. Yeah. Those who are registered are also to be branded on their bodies by fire with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysus, and they shall also be reduced to their former limited status. In order that he might not appear to be an enemy to all, he inscribed below, but if any of them prefer to join those who have been initiated into the mysteries, they shall have equal citizenship with the Alexandrians. Now some, however with an obvious abhorrence of the price to be exacted for maintaining the religion of their city, readily gave themselves up since they expected to enhance their reputation by their future association with the king. But the majority acted firmly with a courageous spirit and did not depart from their religion, and by paying money in exchange for life, they confidently attempted to save themselves from the registration. They remained resolutely hopeful of obtaining help, and they abhorred those who separated themselves from them, considering them to be the enemies of the Jewish nation and of depriving them of common fellowship and mutual help. 
Wow, what a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what mysteries those are, because... Um, the, well, isn't this kind of mystery... Mystery cult? No. Uh, yeah. Well, there were a couple of different, you know, there were lots of mystery cults around then, but I'm just wondering which one it was, because uh, the, you know, the Eucharist in the, you know, at the Last Supper, uh, you know, this is my body, blah, blah, blah. All, <laughs> all that it was taken from some mystery religion, and nobody knows exactly which one, because the details of the various mystery religions have been lost. I thought that was, um, uh, they took that from the Egyptians. Wasn't it Horus? This is my body and this is my blood. They were talking about beer and bread. Yeah, it could be. Um, but it, it, it's not something that was a Jewish tradition at all. And in fact, there was something about it that would have been utterly antithetical to Judaism. Uh, and it's, Maybe it's because of the whole, you know, you can't, you know, that you're not supposed to drink blood. Um, that may have been what it is from, you know, Jewish law, which raises the question of Jehovah's Witnesses, since they don't take blood transfusions, do they do the Eucharist? I don't believe they do. They're kind of wacky. Yeah, just a tad. All right. Uh, let's continue with this. When the impious king comprehended this situation, he became so infuriated that not only was he enraged against those Jews who lived in Alexandria, but was still more bitterly hostile toward those in the countryside, and he ordered that all should be promptly gathered in one place and put to death by the most cruel means. Yeah, so the guy, you know, the hicks in the hills who have no idea what's going on because they're fucking sheep and goats <laughs> get the worst of it because he's madder at them than he is at the other guys. While these matters were being arranged, a hostile rumor was circulated against the Jewish nation by men who conspired to do them ill, a pretext being given by a report that they hindered others from the observance of their customs. The Jews, however, continued to maintain goodwill and unswerving loyalty to the dynasty. Uh, wow. Of course they did. Like lambs before the slaughter. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But because they worshipped God and conducted themselves by his law, they kept their separateness with respect to foods. For this reason, they appeared hateful to some. But since they adorned their style of life with the good deeds of upright people, they were established in good repute among all men. Nevertheless, those of other races paid no heed to their good service, to their nation, which was common talk among all. Hmm. Uh, i got to find more where I'm at. There we go. Instead, they gossiped about the differences in worship and foods, alleging that these people were loyal neither to the king nor to his authorities, but were hostile and greatly opposed to his government. So they attached no ordinary reproach to them. The Greeks in the city, though wronged in no way when they saw an unexpected tumult around these people and the crowds that suddenly were forming, were not strong enough to help them, for they lived under tyranny. They did try to console them, being grieved at the situation, and expected that matters would change. <clears throat> so, obviously, they're trying to curry favor from the Greeks by throwing this line in. Sucks. Yeah. For such a commu great community ought not to be left to its fate when it had committed no offense. And already some of their neighbors and friends and business associates had taken some of them aside privately and were pledging to protect them and to exert more earnest efforts for their assistance. Then the king, boastful of his present good fortune and not considering the might of the supreme god, 
but assuming that he would per persevere constantly in his same purpose, wrote this letter against them. King Ptolemy Philippator, to his generals and soldiers in Egypt and all its districts, greetings and good health. I, myself, and our government are faring well. When our expedition took place in Asia, as you yourselves know, I just want to point out that Asia was not a term that they would have used back then, and they're more than happy to, to use ancient words for cities where we don't use you know, that ancient name, yet now they're using Asia. <sighs> well, it's at the interpreter's discretion, I'm sure. Yeah. When our expedition took place in Asia, as you yourselves know, it was brought to conclusion according to plan by the gods' deliberate alliance with, bat with us in battle. And we considered that we should not rule the nations inhabiting Coli, Syria, and Phoenicia by the power of the spear, but should cherish them with clemency and great benevolence, gladly treating them well. Oh, how sweet. Yeah. And when we had granted very great revenues to the temples and the cities, we came on to Jerusalem also, and went up to honor the temple of those wicked people who never cease from their folly. They accepted our presence by word, but insincerely by deed, because when we proposed to enter their inner temple and honor it with magnificent and most beautiful offerings, they were carried away by their traditional conceit and excluded us from entering, but they were spared the exercise of our power because of the benevolence which we have toward all. No, because you had an epileptic seizure, you idiot. Demons? Could it be Satan? By maintaining their manifest ill will toward us, they became the only people among all nations who hold their heads high in defiance of kings and their own benefactors and are unwilling to regard any action as sincere. But we, when we arrived in Egypt victorious, accommodated ourselves to their folly and did as was proper since we treat all nations with benevolence. That's why we invade them and conquer them. <laughs> well, Among, they're, doing huh? they're doing it lovingly. Yes. Benevolently. As we gentle, gently slaughter all your males. <laughs> Among other things, we made known to all our amnesty toward their compatriots here, both because of their alliance with us and the myriad affairs liberally entrusted to them from the beginning, and we ventured to make a change by deciding both to deem them worthy of Alexandrian citizenship and to make them participants in our regular religious rites. Oh, this guy's a swell feller, isn't he? Yes, he is. But in their innate malice, they took this in a contrary spirit and disdained what is good since they inclined, incline constantly to evil. They not only spurn our priceless citizenship, but also, both by speech and by silence, they abominate those few among us, those few among them, who are sincerely disposed toward us. In every situation, in accordance with their infamous way of life, they secretly suspect that we may soon alter our policy. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah. Would be a first time, right? Yeah. Therefore, fully convinced by these indications that they are ill disposed towards us in every way, we have taken precautions lest, if a sudden disorder should arise against us, we should have these impious people behind our backs as traitors and barbarous enemies. Therefore, we have given orders that as soon as this letter shall arrive, you are to send to those of us. Those who live among you, together with their wives and children, with insulting and harsh treatment, and bound securely with iron fetters, to suffer the sure and shameful death that befits enemies. For when these have all been punished, we are sure for that, that for the remaining time the government will be established for ourselves in good order and in the best state. 
But whoever shelters any of the Jews, old people or children, or even infants will be tortured to death with the most hateful torments together with his family. Anyone willing to give information will receive the property of the one who incurs the punishment and also 2,000 drachmas from the royal treasury and will be awarded his freedom. Every place detected sheltering a Jew is to be made unapproachable and burned with fire and shall become useless for all time to any mortal creature. The letter was written in the above form. Ah, that's hugely implausible. Yeah, in so many ways. Yeah. That's it for this episode of The Atheist in the Trailer Park Podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as just about anywhere else podcasts can be found. Many of the episodes are also on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter. At T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. It's on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash trailerparkatheist.com. If you happen to like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast, there's a donate button on the show notes page. You can support it via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TN Tucker. Thanks for listening. Say goodnight, Fuzznuts. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting. Damned cat.